Okay, so today we'll start um, our lectures about just to review what we did um, the last lectures. The last lecture we covered the um, uh, J unit testing strategies, encapsulation and uh, information hiding, and also we uh, discuss the getter and setter methods. We said that we need to hide the information by making the attributes private so the client will not be able to access these attributes. We can access these attributes using get method or set method. And normally get or set method are public and available for the client. And the client can use get method or set method to change the value of the private fields. And also we discuss what is the immutable objects, that the object you created, once you construct these objects, it will stay with the same status as long as you run your applications. To change the status of immutable objects, you have to destroy it and create it again. And the example and one of the famous example of immutable objects are strings. Strings, once you create them, you already set some attribute and the value for the string. To change the value of the string or the string that you already create at the beginning of your program, you have to destroy it and create it again. And also we discuss and we close the last lectures by discussing the final keyword. So all these topics, we cover them from the last lectures. And also I encourage all of you if you are all late or you join uh, at the beginning of this week or you just recently joined to go to the Moodle and review all the previous topics. And as you can see in one lecture we're not only j just covering one topic because we still on the background reviewing some materials and also injecting some new concepts of Java programming like Java J units. Now regarding what we're going to discuss today, we're going to go over and continue the final keyword. We didn't finalize it last time. We're going to finalize it today. And we're going to come to the new topics which is about overriding the object method. We say that in the Java, you cannot create a method or define some fields without creating them inside the class. So you need a class, and the name of the class is the same as the name of the file. So the name of the file is, the name of the class dot Java is the name of the class. Inside it, you define the fields, and you define the method. And now, we say that any class you created, it will have some default behavior and from where this behavior is coming is coming from the object class which is the parent of any class you created inside your applications and we're going to go over two string methods equals methods hashing code methods compare to method and clone method and these are the five famous methods Whenever you decided to create a class or decide to create an object, whenever you decide to create a class, that means you decide to create an object. So you have your own object. To make your object work in the right way, in appropriate way, to handle in the appropriate way, you have to visit these five methods. You have to visit these five methods and put your implementation for these methods. For example, if you create an object and you need to store this object inside hash map, to be able to use the hash map, you need to override the hash code method. Once you override it, now you store the object and you need to make sure these two objects are equal. So you have to visit equal. You need to compare the objects and make sure they are sorted or not sorted. You have to visit compare two. You need to make a clone of your object. You have to visit the clone. You need to print your object status to the client or to the uh, user. 
you have to visit to string. So these are five main methods. Whenever you decide to create a new object and add it to the Java, you have to visit this method and do your contribution for this method. Let us proceed. If you decide to sleep, I don't recommend you to sleep because this is very, very important and I would all of you to focus and this is very important class today, especially overriding the object method and the lab test one will be mainly based on this class in addition to the previous. Now, just to finalize our discussion, we said that final has a magic. This is a keyword. Whenever you decide to use it with local variable, you can use it with the local variable. You can use it with the field and attributes. You can use it with the static fields. And once you use it with the static fields, that means this is constant where class. You can use it for a class. Once you use final with the class, you cannot extend this class. You cannot create a child from this class. This kind of concept we're going to come over once we reach the inheritance. Also, we can use final with the method. Once we say this method is final, we cannot override it. We cannot override this method. Final, like this example of using the final with int type, final int answer is equal to 42 with the local variable. That means this is a constant. No one can change it. Now, you can use it with the field private final string name. And that means this field, once we set the value for this field, nobody can change it. And we can set the value for these final fields by using the constructors, by using the constructors. Now, if we decide to have final with the statics, that means these are constant bare class. So whenever you create a new object from your class, it will have the same copy of this constant. Also, we can use final with the class as you see in this example public final class point that means you create a point class point and you can create a type of class point but this class cannot create a child class okay cannot create or extend this class you can use final with the method for example public final end get x will retain a value of x and this method is final that means we cannot override this method in a child class. Final reference. Sometimes we use final with the reference. That is a variable referred to an object. We have to be careful in this type. So really when you are using final with an object does not mean that the object status can never change and we have to be careful. And I give you an example here. You can see here we have final point two with the class that I always discussed in the previous lectures. Point two and we name the name of the variable is P1. So P1 is the name of the variable and this variable is contained a memory address where the object a new point two is created. So the value of the P1 is fixed but not the state of the object. Still the object state is x and y. What's the value for x? Is a 3. What's the value for y? Is 5. This is the state of the object, is the value of the field. But p1 is fixed, is pointing to this object. Now, still, we cannot do this. We cannot change the relation. We cannot let p1 point to another object. Assume that you are want to create a new point. A new point with x is equal to 4, y is equal to 7, we cannot do this because p1 is final. It's pointing to the point where the status is x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 5. And that's fixed. p is fixed. p1 is fixed, but not the status. You can do this. You can do this. You can change x. You can change y. So we have to be careful if we are using final with a reference. As you can see here, P1 is a reference. It's pointing to an object. Using final doesn't mean the state of the object is fixed. It means that the reference is fixed. So you are pointing 
to the chain number one. You cannot change it, but you can still raise number one and put number two. The same thing. You pointing to the point three and five. Still, you can go and change x, change y, but still p is pointing to the same point. So you can change the status while you have p one is fixed. But you cannot use p one and create a new point and use that as a new reference. Okay. When we define a static as a final constant, that means this constant bear a class. Bear a class. So you have a class, okay? Let's say you have a create a class called car. This class will represent a car. You create an object from car. One of the things that is fixed for you is the number of wheels inside this car. It's four. So you say, I need, whenever I create a new object, from this class called car, I define a public integer statics number of wheels is equal to four. So whenever you create a new object, let's say Mercedes or whatever is Toyota you create, still they have the same copy of the number of wheels. So the number of wheels is the pair class, not pair object. If you're not using a static with the final, that means each object has his own copy of this constant. Okay, so static means this field is pair class. So all the objects from this class have the same constant. If you decide to remove a static, that means this constant become a copy and you repeat it all three objects. Okay, it might be now is not so significant. Sometimes constant means something big very large in terms of the memory. You have to reserve it. So if you don't put it as a static, every time you create an object, you will copy it again and copy it again. You will waste the memory because it's a constant. So why you are copying it? If this is a constant better class, it's good to make a static. So all the object have one copy. Okay, so back to this slide number five. We are emphasizing that whenever we use final with the reference, that the reference is fixed, but the state of the object is not fixed, we still we can change it. Now, there is a benefit of using immutable object. Immutable object always have one state, and once we create a mutable object, we cannot change the state of that object. And you design your program to create an object in the appropriate state, so it's not inconsistent state. values of the fields. When we say a state of the object, always the value of the fields. So you create a class, you have fields, and these fields receive a value. The value of these fields represent the state of the objects. Now, you can freely share that mutable object because they are read-only objects. And mutable object, as I said, is, can be shared and also is a thread safe. So if you have multiple thread program, you can share mutable object freely without worrying about changing the status of mutable objects. Now, this is a class, it's called a fraction. And this class is implement a clonable interface and comparable interface. We're gonna come across these next, next slides. And this class, it's immutable. Why this class is immutable? Any suggestions? Any why this class is immutable? Can anyone help us why this class is immutable? By looking to this class, I can say this class is immutable. Why? Yes? It's public. The class is public. It's accessible by the client. No. You can use it. We're not saying it's immutable or not immutable because we are using a private. If I use a private class, I will not allow the client to use it. Okay? When I use public class, I allow the client to use it. But when we say immutable or non-immutable, 
That means the object can be changed the status. Once I create the object, I can change the status of the object. Yes, you can create a new subclass from this because this is class is not final. Any other note also? You can see here we have set numerator, set denominators. So once we create the class using the constructors, we have two type of constructors, but fractions, we give one argument constructors, and we have the second constructors where we have two arguments. And once we create the object, we have a, an opportunity to get the value for numerator and denominators, and also to set the value for denominator and numerator. And we say, if we are trying to create a immutable object, we should not allow the client to set the value of the field. There's no set method or a mutator method inside the uh, class. Also, the last for methods is allow you to change the status because it's retained void. You can add some value to the current status. You can subtract some value. You can multiply some value of the current status and you can divide the current fractions. So you just send the fraction and you take the current status, you divide it, you subtract it, you add it, you do whatever is you need and you retain void to the client. So this is, is immutable class. How we can take this class and generate immutable objects? How we can transfer it? What we should do? Yes, so this method is about clone compared to equal and to string. We're going to come to it and we have to look at the void here. Look at this. I want to drag your attention to this void. We're going to change it now once we decide to make it immutable so we close it look at this we add final as you suggest this is final that means you cannot extend this class there is a recipe on the previous slide we come across the recipe from one to five steps how you convert immutable class to immutable class so first we add final we didn't change its implement comparable or clonable we're gonna come across that next slides okay now, final, private, final, int, numerators, and denominator. We add final to the fields. So these fields are final. Doesn't mean these fields are constant. These final, we can set them only once. And when that happens, once we use the constructors, once we use a new fraction, we give the value for a Nominators, we give the value for the denominator, we set this value. And once we did that, this value is fixed, close. No one can change this value because we are using final. So final with the field doesn't mean these fields are constant. No one can set them. We can set the final fields using the constructor. Now, we have get method. We leave the get method the same. But now we remove all the set method and there is no clone method. We cannot clone the object to make it um, mutable. Still we have compare to, we equal, still we have it, to string, still we have it. Now, look at this, we change the add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So now we send a fraction, we take the current status of the fraction, we add them together, and we retain a new object a new fraction object. We're not changing the current status of this object. We're retaining a new object to the client. So you, have, you need to add a new fractions to our current fractions number. We take them, we add them, and we ship back to the client a new fraction object. So this is the previous implementation for mutable version of a fraction. So we receive a fraction number. We calculate the numerators, and we calculate the denominators, okay? So if you have two fraction number, you take the numerator of the first one, you multiply it with the denominator of the second one, plus the other numerators times the denominator of this fraction, this becomes a new numerator. And also, 
the denominator, we multiply them together. You see this version modify the current status of the fraction number because it's modified directly the field numerator and denominator. So this is the version for mutable object. Now look at the version of immutable object. You can see here the retain type is a fraction object. So you retain a new object to the client. You calculate, you define int n, you calculate the numerators, you calculate the denominator, and look at the retain. Retain a new fraction, and you call the constructor with a new value for n and a new value for d. The current status for this object is not changed. We are shipping back a new fraction object. Any questions about the difference between the version of mutable and immutable? Okay. Now we will start a new topic. And it's very important topic. It's very essential for also for the next topics on this course. And we're going to carry this topics with us all over the semester. Objects. This is what your class that you are extending. Even if you not explicitly write it down in your code, Java will extend this class. So if you just write a class chair, Java will understand this is a class chair extend object. It will do it for you. As we saw that Java sometimes, even if we didn't provide a constructor, it will provide us with implicit no argument constructors. So we have to be careful. Java sometimes fill the blank, whatever we did. So whenever we create an object or a class, we are extending from object class. Now, I'm not going to go detailed what is the object class is. You have the, this link on the slide. Go over it. Read more about it. Know about this class. It's a parent for any class on the Java. And they call it a, as a super class. Super of the super. Everything is objects in the Java. So you go there and you will find that this lesson will really give you the brief discussion we're going to give today is about the six main methods that inside the object and that we need also to revisit these methods and we override them so our object that we create inside our application behave correctly. One of these methods and one of the famous methods is clone method. And this clone method starts with the protected. And we're going to come across later on what is mean by protected. Retain object. Retain type is object. Clone, the name of the method. There is no argument given to this method. And this method throw an exception. It's called a clone not supported exception. If you sometimes you didn't override this method and you try to create a clone of your object, it will give you a, this exception, a clone not supported exception. So you have to go and create and retain a copy of the object. We have equals. This method is public. That means it's accessible for anyone. The client can access this method. It's retain a Boolean. That means either true or false. The name of the method is equal. And look at the side in the argument. is object, which is means any type. Any type. We send an, an of argument with type objects. We didn't specify what class is an object. So indicate that this object is equal to this object, okay? The object that is you currently working on. Now, another protected method, we're not gonna discuss this method actually. It's a protected void finalized throw throwables. So this method is about the garbage collectors. And this is more and more advanced. It's not a scope of this course. It's sometimes when you need to destroy your object. You need to destroy your object in appropriate manners. So you have to override this method. But normally, all the objects we're going to create in this class, we're going to rely on the garbage collectors that is built automatically for the Java to destroy our objects. 
Now, we have this public final class, get class. We're not going to override this method, but we're going to use it frequently. This method retain the runtime class of an object. So whenever you call this method, it will retain the class. Why we're not overriding this method? As you can see, there is a final. So once we have final, we, do not, we cannot override this method because it's a public, it's accessible by the client. Final, no one can override this method and retain a class which is the name of the class. Public integer hash code, this will retain a hash code for your object. It will look at the status of your object that you are creating and retain a number, integer number. And this is very useful method. We have to override it in case if we need to use the collection. We're going to come across the collection later on in this course and we can use hash map, hash set, okay? And we can use these to fast accessing the memory so we're going to rely on the hash code and how you are efficiently generating the hash code. And also we have public string to string. So this simply retain a representation of your status, how you're going to print your object to the client, how you're going to make the, uh, the, this object visible to the client, print it as a string. So you can see this is a public and retain type is a string, there is no argument. So it's a print the current status of the object. It's required to implement all these methods if you want your object to correctly work with other class libraries. Also, we have compare to, we're going to come across that. So these are main methods. We inherit them. We have them. Even if you, not, if you didn't ask for them, Java provided to you. So you have to take care of them and sometimes you need to override them to have appropriate behavior in your program. Let us start with the first one, two string. So this is a retain a string representation for your object. So, so whenever you call your object, you create a class, you need to call this object using a print or a print line, it will automatically call a string, two string methods. For example, you have here the class of a student is a public class, it has a protected string name, and also it has a default constructor, no argument constructors. Public students with no argument inside this constructor and there is zero statement on the body. And also we have a constructor where is one argument of type string is sent to the object. And once we receive S, we assign it to name. So the name and S are pointing to the same string. Now public string get name and it will retain what the name of the student now inside our main methods so we test this class using the main method we define a new string of n so you have a student that is the name of the class you give the name for the variable stu equal new student and you give a string inside that new students n so now which constructor you're going to call? The default one, then we're going to call the one argument, or we're going to call no argument constructor first, then we're going to go to set the attribute second, or we're going to call the one argument constructor on the first time. We're going to call the second constructor, the uh, constructor with the first argument. We're not going to call the default constructor. No one going to call the default constructor. So we're going to call that second constructor and we're going to set the name. Now someone asked to stu dot to string, the last line. So in this line what we are doing, we are printing the status of the object, what you are expecting to see as an output. Is this is two string method? By default, you have it. You didn't ask for it. You didn't write it here on the code. Java provided to you. So what is the default behavior for two string? Print nothing. Memory address. OK, sometimes. So this is the actual behavior. We're going to have the name of the class at the memory address of the object. 
So this is the actual default behavior. We have this behavior from the Java provided to us. It will print the class name. So in this case, class name is a student at the address of your memory. And this address might be different based on the platform or based on the machine that you are running the program. So this is the actual behavior. We didn't ask for two string. We have it. We print it. That's what we got. And this is what we need. We need to print the status of the student. So we have to revise the behavior of the two string. We have to change the default behavior. How we can change the default behavior? Any suggestions? What? Overwriting the two string. That's correct. So we have to override this inside our object. So we provide public string. And we have to be precise with the same signature. You remember the signature of the method? Public string to string. And we provide the implementation. And this case is, this is our implementation. We ask for retain my name is, we give the name of the field, plus I am a student. So this is the string representation for our objects. Now, do you think what will be the output in case of we ask again? Will it print the string? Yes. Any question? Yes. If we even remove two string, it will call two string. If we just write system dot output dot print line and we give the name stu, the Java will automatically, implicitly go and call two string. Okay. Yes, it will print like this because we specify it on the behavior of two string. We override it. Okay, so now back to the our class is a point two, or now we name it as a simple point two. We create the new point and we would like to print it out in this representation by always square uh, curly brackets or circle brackets with minus 1.1 comma 1.5. So we change the two string behavior as we override the two, two string. At override, it's not, it's used for readability and it's very useful whenever you decide to create an ABI. So whenever you decide to create an ABI, the ABI will let the client know this method is not a new in this class. This method is overridden in this class. So the original method was in the parent class, or maybe in the parent of the parent class. We override it here. So what override is an optional, but is very useful for readability. And if you decide to generate an ABI to let the client be aware that this method is not a new, we override this method, okay? And this method is coming from Java long dot objects in this case, okay? Now, sometimes you need to compare an object for equality. You create an object and you need to see if these objects are equal or not. That means equal, equal. And normally we are using equal, equal for a primitive type. If you have a double, you need to compare it with another double, you are using equal, equal. If you need to compare if this integer is equal to another integer, you are using equal, equal, or not equal, even. Uh, now, we are comparing for equality. We're not comparing for sorting, which one is coming first, which coming come next. If this laptop is equal to this laptop, so we are comparing the specification of this laptop compared to that laptop. We're not saying if this laptop comes the first and this comes second. Okay, we're not comparing by the order. 
of the laptop. We're comparing the status, the actual specification of this laptop compared to the second laptop specification. If the memory here is the same, RAM is the same, the CPU is the same, so whatever you decide to see the specification, that gives you a, a hint, this laptop is equal to this laptop, it's your implementation, because you are creating a class of name laptop, and you define a status of this laptop by, for example, the size of the RAM, the CPU name, or the generation of the CPU, i7 generation 7, generation 8, i5, i3, you give this a status for your class. So this has become a status, become an object of this laptop. Then you compare it to another laptop. If they are the same CPU, the same RAM, you say, yes, they have, these laptops are equal. Now, this kind of behavior about equality, we should define it once we decide to create a class on the Java. So, if you create two points, as you can see here on this slide, B1 and B2, and you give them with the same value for X, the same value for Y, and you decide to say, if B1 equal equal to B2, print equal. Actually, this is false. You cannot compare B1 and B2. Why? B1 is a reference to an object. B2 is a reference to an object. That's right. B1 store an address where this object is, exists in the memory. So B1 is pointing to an object, maybe exists at address 600. B2 is pointing to an object, maybe exists at address 700. Now you say, is 700 is equal to 600? No. The status of the object are equal. That's why it's very important to override the equal method behavior. So you can see here, I put a yellow and red to indicate that they are exist on different addresses, but the status is the same. So still Java will compare the default behavior here, will compare only the address, and will retain false. So if you are using double, it will store the actual value in the memory. So you have double D1, double D2, the actual value in the memory is 7.5. So that's why it, whenever you decide to compare between two doubles, you will return true or false. That's correct because you are comparing the actual value. But remember, the reference variable always stores the memory address. So whenever you decide to compare between B1 and B2, both are at different addresses. So that will not work with you correctly. So equal equal work with the primitive type perfectly, no problem. But once you have to come to the object, it's not good to use equal equal. So with the reference variable, it's not recommended to use equal equal to say that if these two objects are equal or not. it will compare the addresses. That's the default behavior. The addresses for the object. So B1 is equal to equal to B2 will retain false because B1 and B2 are the reference address. That's the default behavior. Okay? So this is will give you the this slide will give you the hint for how the memory is organized. So B at address 600, B2 at address 600 because B2 and B1, B2 and B they are referring to the same object, B3 at address 700. What is at address 600 is 1 and 2. What at address 700 is 1 and 2. This is exactly how the memory is created once you run these three statements. So B will be at address 600. What is the status? 1 and 2. And B2 will be also at address 600 because they are pointing at the same objects. Okay? But B3 is having the same status but is actually is existing on different address on the memory. So, to make this happen, we have to use equals to compare the object for equality. So, you can see this, and you might use this before. It's a string dot equal. To compare that two strings are equal or not, we're using a string dot equal because we need to rely on the behavior of equals to make sure that two strings are equal or not. We are not using equal equal with the strings because the strings are objects. If we are using equal equal with the string, that means we are comparing the memory addresses of these strings. 
to compare the actual string, we are using a string dot equals, and we give the other object to the string. So here, we are comparing between point one and point two, also with dot equals. But again, we fail to compare P1 and P2 because the actual behavior that Java provided to us is looking at the addresses, is not looking at the status of P1, P2. We are not using equal, equal, but still we fail. Why? Because Java provided the default behavior to equality, which is just simply look at the addresses of the objects. So we look at the address of P1, look at the address of P2, they are not equal, so we retain false. This behavior is inherited by the class of Java. As I mentioned, this behavior we have to override it to make sure our objects are compared for equality in correct manner. So how we can implement equals method? This is the initial implementation. We have to override it. So we retain it true. Let's say this is a simple implementation for the equals. Remember, the equals receive object type. But now someone decides to send simple point two to the equals. So he implement this method. Public Boolean equals, and we send simple point two, and we name the variable of our parameter as others. Now, if x equal to equal to other x, we can use equal equal here. Why? Because x of type int which is a primitive type, okay? And y is equal to equal to other y, which means the status of this point is the same as the status of that point, we retain it true. Otherwise, we retain false. So look here, we override the default implementation, and we check the status, the fields, and we use the appropriate way to checking the field. And we are lucky that the field that we have here on the simple point are a primitive types. So we can use equal, equal for that. So in this case, uh, we can change the implementation. As you know, uh, just to highlight in this slide that the implementation can be different. So someone write if a statement like this, but someone decide to make it only one line as retain if x equal, equal to other dot x and, and y is equal to other y. So if it's legal to compare simple point two to any other object, yes? You can compare this apple, if this apple is equal to this uh, orange, or might be there is a, a, a gala type of uh, apples, and you need to compare it with Spartan apples, or Macintosh apples. There's a different also t category inside the apples, okay? So you need to see if this is a type of the same apple, or maybe different category, okay? You need to compare the apple with the banana, okay? Is this is valid? You need to compare, is this is a laptop or a smartphone? Can I check that? Yes, it should be able to do this. Your method should be able to do this equal, should accept simple point two or any other type of object. So we should say like this, simple point two, P is equal to new point seven and two, and we decide to say if P dot equal is equal to hello, we should return false, okay? And hello is a string. We should compare the point to the string, yes? Let us see. So that's why the default method inside the object, the Java programmer decided to have this signature for equals. Public, Boolean, equals, and what is the argument? Only one argument and of type objects. So they can give the flexibility to the user of Java. You can compare for equality any type. Don't be restricted that once you are comparing for equality for a simple point two. You create a class of laptop, just comparing laptop. No, you can compare laptop to the smartphone, okay? You can compare the car to the truck. Yes, we can add uh, at override for annotations. 
but this is the default signature for the, the method. Public Boolean equals the name object of type object, the name between the triangle bracket, the name, any name. Then you put any sentence you like to override this method. So we must have a type of object to be able to compare with any type of objects. And that's give us more generality and more flexibility. So this is kind of wrong implementation. So someone decide, OK, I will not change anything. I just go and change the header. Just simply say object and we send all. Now, do you think this will run? Java will say, no, this is wrong. We cannot run this because there is an exception will be raised. Not all objects have x and y as a field. Yes? If you send hello as a string, is a hello object? Yes, hello is an object. What is the type of hello? Is a string. Is a string object has a field, x and y? No. And now you are saying, I want to go to access o.x and o.y. Java will say, come on, there's no sense here. The object that you are given to me, there, there is no field x or y inside it. So we'll give you this exception. You cannot find the symbol and variable x and all of this. So this wrong implementation. We have to take care of this. So we have to investigate and look at the object that we receive as an argument. If this object can be a simple point, we have to cast it. Otherwise, we retain false. If we try to compare a point to string, we look at the type of the argument. If this type of argument is not a point, immediately we retain false to the user. This is a different type. Why we should waste our time comparing things? So we try to make this by trying to casting. You know, you have an integer, you can cast it to double. Again, you have an object, you can cast it. So you take O as a type of object. You try to cast that type to a simple point two. Do you think this is will work? So you try to say you send a string, and you tell the Java, I know that I send a string, but please treat this string as a simple point too. What do you think Java will say to you? Yes, OK, that's good. Thank you for letting me know. I will do it. Then I try to take the hello and try to manufacture a new pro, uh, object of type simple point two and proceed and find x and y. Do you think that will happen? Or maybe it will call default constructor. That's good. So we take hello as type of string, and we call a default constructor. Is that possible? And we create a type of simple point two. Because that is the casting is. Because we send int, for example, we cast it to double, and we do this. Actually, this is will not work. This will not work. OK? You will try to promise that by doing this, you promise Java, Java will rely on you. You promise Java that O is a type of simple point two, but that's not the case. Sometimes you send different type. You cannot cast string to simple point two. We cannot do this, okay? So whenever you send these two points, if they are equal, you send these two points, then P1, because you're calling P1, dot equals, we go to the P1, so P1 will be this, and O will be the other, you cast it. So you always promise Java that what I'm sending to you is actually simple point two, which is not true. You, sometimes you send a string, sometimes you send any def different objects. So this is exception will happen in case of you doing this. So once you decide to send hello as a string, Java will tell you that we cannot do this casting. The cast the class cast exceptions. This is a string. We cannot do this. So still, we are on the exception side. So we change. We're not only sending simple point two. We're sending an object. But now we have to de deal with this problem. How we can deal with this problem? We can look at the type of object at the beginning. If this type of the object is not simple point two, immediately we return to the client false. Otherwise, we proceed in the comparison and we look in detail for the status. We use instant of. This is a keyword. We use it to make sure that this kind of object is an instance of this class. So let us see. That's the syntax. You give the variable name. 
an instance of and you give the type. If this is the name, is an instance of a string or not? Let us see some example. So here we define a string s equal to hello, and we define a simple point 2, p is equal to new point 2. So we just call the default constructor in this case. So we ask, if s is an instance of simple point 2, we're going to have false, because s is a string, is not a simple point 2. So simple point 2 is the type. Look at the syntax on the top. So the name of the variable, s, an instance of simple point 2, we retain false. S is an instance of string, that's true. Uh, P is an instance of simple point 2, that's true. And P is uh, an instance of string, that's false. Null is an instance of string, that's false. So this is how we can use an instance of to check. We're going to come to that uh, one fact about an instance 2 later on, but this is how we can use an instance of to check the type of object immediately. So we reject any other type immediately before we go to the equality. So you can see here, we look at the simple point two. This is another implementation for equals. We receive a type of object, O, and then we say if O, in instance of simple point two, we proceed. Otherwise, else, we're going to return false immediately to the client. Now, once we are satisfied about that O is a simple point two, we can do the casting. Now Java will not say anything, will not raise any exception, because we are guaranteeing that O is a, an instance of type simple point 2. And now we did our statement that if x is equal to x and y is equal to y, and we return it true to that client. Any question? Yes, we cast it like this, by putting the type. So simple point 2 is the type or the name of the class. No, simple point two is not a primitive type. It's still a primitive type if you have integer int a, you want to cast it to double p, still you can put between the bracket double. That's we kind of come to that once we cover the inheritance. Okay? Now, yes? Because we send it as an object in the argument here. You see in the argument, what the type of the argument? Object. So still, we have to do the casting. Okay? So you send O as a reference to an object, okay? Imagine you are putting, you're sending some mail or some items to your friend. You go to the mail, okay? You have to put it in some envelope to send the letter, yes? Okay? It's just a piece of paper. You write whatever is in it. To send it by mail, what you should do? You have to put it inside the envelope. And what you should write on the envelope on the top? the address of destination and the source. It's something similar to this idea. When we ever create an object, we need to send it to equal. We have to ship it in some a certain way on objects. Okay? And object is the parent of all our objects inside applications. Okay? Good? So we send it by standard mail, you can think about it. Okay? It's, a, uh, it's clear? That's why now, once we receive it inside the object, oh, I receive it an object, I receive the letters, so I open the letter, I guarantee this is the letter for me because I look at the destination, this is my letters. So I go to F statement, now I have to open it and see what is written inside it, okay? Now, it's the same thing. You ship it to the equal by calling an object. Now, you receive it inside the equal, you have to cast it to simple point two. This version is correct to compare simple two to any type but not fully satisfy the equal contract. Oh, what is this? Whenever you decide to make comparison between two objects for equality, you have to satisfy the equality contract. And what is this contract? Let us see the next slide. The contract is saying that if your implementation for equality should satisfy one to five contract constraint. And I remember 
in the discrete math, if you cover some kind of relations on the discrete math, you come across these terms. This relation is reflexive. That means the equality here should be reflexive, symmetrics, transitions, consistent, and must not throw exception when we pass null. Okay? So these are five facts whenever you decide to override equal methods. You have to take care of it. So let us see. Reflexive. If someone x equal to x, what do you think should retain? True. Always true. If you create an object of type x and you say x is equal to x, it should be the same. I'm the same person. Okay? Good? So it should be equal true. Always. So if they violate this constraint, you have a broken implementation for the equal. Yeah, there's a lot of ways. Okay? Now, uh, x should be equal to x. Now, when we say x, that means the status of the object should be equal to the status of the same object. Okay? <coughs> Symmetric. If x equal to y is give me true, if and only if y is equal to x. So if x is equal to y, then y should be equal to x. If y is equal to x, then x should be equal to y, because that is f and only f. It's a direction, both directions. Okay? Good? So you have to check your equality. When I say this, when I ask you in the test to write the equal method, I will check this actually on my J unit test. I will send the same object. I will expect to have true in the J unit test. I will send x is equal to y. Then I will expect y should be equal to x because x is equal to y if and only if y is equal to x. Now, transition. If x is equal to y, true, and y is equal to z, then we have x is equal to z. That is what we call a transition. So if we have a three objects, if the first one is equal to the second, and the second is equal to the third, so the first one should be equal. It's like a triangle. We have to complete it. Now, consistent. So whatever is the status of the object is not changed. If the status of the object is not changed, and you start, they are equal at the beginning of your program, they should be equal at the end of the program. Okay? So if the status of the object is not changed, given that you create two objects, and they are equal at the beginning of the execution of your program, and you're not changing anything in the status, they should be equal at the end of the program. Now, x equal to null, always we should retain false. So we always, we have to check for the null option, okay, at the beginning. If the reference that we receive is null, immediately we retain false to the user. We should not waste our time trying to compare this object. So this is an example for equals. So if the object, this object is equal to this object, that's they are both referring to the same memory address. So we return true. Why we should waste our time? If the object is equal to null, which is the name of the argument, we return false immediately. If this dot get class, and we say that this method we have it, gonna retain the name of our class. If this dot get class is not equal to object dot get class, that means both objects are reference, but they are not the same class, so we retain false. Now, if that is not the case, so that means we can cast the object to simple point two, and we check if x is equal to x and y is equal to y, and we retain false otherwise. So, there is some trick here or hint that I would like you to know about it whenever you come across implementation of equals. So, if you have double or float, use equal equal. If you have float, sometimes it's good to use float dot float to int fits. Okay, as you can see on this implementation, we take the float number, we convert it to int bits, then we compare the two floats together. Why we do this? Because sometimes the machine is different 
okay, machines and instruction set for each machine is different. Now, double also they have a double dot, uh, I mean double do long by bits. And if you have array, don't try to go over all the element inside the array to see if the array is equal or not. Use arrays dot, this is arrays is a collection class, dot equals. And you send your array that this will verify the equality for you. Okay? And if you have a reference type like a string, don't say string is equal equal to another string. You try to use dot equals, string dot equal. And also try to utilize this for any other type you are using. So if some of the, your fields is from different type, you try to rely on dot equal implementation for that type. Here we use this dot get class. We're not using an instance of and in the all the best practice was to use an instance of, but then later on it's become get class is most dominant because instance of is not working right if you have inheritance. We're gonna come across that later on when we have an inheritance. So an equal method, if you are implementing equal method for the labs work, for the lab test, you try to use this dot git class, object dot git class. Don't use an instance of. That's based on the status of the object. In this case, you can see if x is equal to x, y is equal to y, that means these two objects are equal. There's no other status. There's no, uh, all the fields that represent the status of this point are included in the equality implementation, okay? So the simple point two has only two fields, x and y. So x is already, I take care of it. Y, I already take care of it. So any kind of status for this object, I already take care of it in equality, okay? Now, you don't see that if in case of your point, let's say a three-dimensional point, and you only compare for X and Y. You don't care about Z. That means equality is broken. In that case, you can see that X is not equal to, equal to Y, but Y is equal to Z, but X is not equal to Z, okay? Whenever you are trying to make equality, make sure you compare the status of object and all the fields represent the status of the object are included on the method implementation for equals. Now, that's equals and uh, let us start now a new idea, give you a new idea before we go to the hashing code method. Hashing, what is hashing? Hashing is actually a technique to find element in a data structure quickly. How we can do that? We take the data and we try to represent data by integer value, by hashing code. We give a hashing code. It's like you go to the library, the book, they have a title, but each library have the unique representation where is this book should be on the shelf. So you can see Q, A, T, K, A, Q, C, Q, P. All these is a code help you to quickly go to the right shelf and pick up the book. And they use the year, they use the version of the book, they use the QA, for example, for computer science. All most of the computer science book you find it in QA, okay? TK for electrical engineering. Most of the electrical engineering books you find it in TK. I know them because I, or normally I go there. So that is the code, that type of coding we use in the library we are familiar with is exactly hashing. The library, they do hashing to help us to quickly find the data we are looking for, to find the right book. So the hashing code is the integer value used to find an array index. It's exactly the code of the book to find where is in the shelf, which one in the, uh, in the library, which location, first floor, second floor, to the left, to the right, which shelf on the library. So imagine you have an array, and the index of array from zero to n. So the hash code is simply an index where I can look inside this array. I'm 
I don't listen. I don't know. Okay. So hash table is an array. So index of array and hash table is the array. Hash function take the data, take your objects, and generate a number. And we use this number to store the value on that location. Okay. So I hope the concept of hashing is clear. If you have any questions, you can ask. So for hashing, we need the three components. We need the hashing function that take the data and generate the code. And this called hashing code. We use the hashing code to store the information in a specific location. And we need some sort of hashing table. Okay, Hashing table where we store this data after we generate the hashing code. So in Java, we have hash set and hash map. And we use hash code methods to generate this. So the hash code method is actually is the hashing function. Okay? So if you decide to override equals, you must override the hash code. This is some in Java it's mandatory. If you decide to override equals, you have also to override the hash code. Okay? Now, otherwise the container will work not in appropriate manners. So if you decide, no, I'm not going to follow this rule. I'm going to override equals. I'm not going to take care of hashing. I will leave it. I will take the default implementation of the hashing. You will not be able to use the hash map and hash set in appropriate manners. Okay? So this is, for example, the client code. Let us see the beautiful of using hashing. You create a point with 1 and minus 2 as a status. We call it P. And then you store it inside a hashing set. You create a hashing set, and you say, inside this hashing set, I will store an object of type simple point 2. Now, you add P to the hash set. Yes? Now, you create, you print this, h.contains P, will retain it true. That's true, because h is the hash set. Yes, it contains P. Now, you create another point called the Q. Look at the Q. It has the same status of P. So if I implement the previous implementation for equal, I call P dot equals Q, I will have a true. Yes? Because they have the same status. X is equal to 1, Y is equal to minus 2. But look now, if I ask H dot contains Q, what should I expect as a retain? I should expect true, but now, actually, I will have false. Why? Because I rely on the default implementation for the Java. I didn't implement the hash code right now. The only I did is implement equals. Look at the first line. If you implement equals, you should implement hash code. We didn't do that. We just implement equals. So the implementation is broken. Look here. We use hash set, and we send the P with a status 1 and minus 2, and we create a Q, and we try to ask if the hash set is this set, is it containing this point? It will retain false because it's not looking at the status. Because the hash code is, we rely on the default implementation for the hash code. Now, let us see this one. So. Suppose you have a list of unique points, okay? And you would like to check if the point is there on the list or not. So the only way is to do it is what? To go over all the elements inside the array and check for equality. If this point is equal to that. You are doing search now. Yes? We're doing search. So we take the four loops. Now, inside the for loop, and say point dot, point equals, P, then return it true. So you can see that the header of the function has point. We send the point P, and we have a list of all the points, and we try to see if the point is exist or not. So if the point is equal inside the P, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. Yes? That's how we set the equality. So this is a linear search, which is called sometimes sequential search. And this is very, very large and time-consuming search. 
if you have an n elements, so in the worst case, you have to go over all elements. In the best case, you just find it in the first element. Okay? On the worst case, we have to look at all elements. In the best case, we look in the first element, and on the average, n over 2. And we're going to come to the time complexity later on on the uh, topics. But imagine you are searching for some items okay, on the library. You just have the title of the book. So you're going to visit all the books, and you compare the titles. If the title is equal, then I find my book. Imagine how much time consuming. Maybe you're lucky. Once you go to the shelf, immediately you find it. Or maybe after three comparison of the books, you find it. Okay? Maybe you have to spend all the day comparing, and you're not lucky. So that is the linear search, the linear search. So to make it fast, we're using the hash code. And that's why we store the point on the hashing set. We can quickly say if the ha this point is exists on the hashing set or not. If uh, the point that I'm looking for is there or not, the hashing code will do this fast for me. Let us see the hash code has its work. Let us assume we have this array of a space or a packets. Okay? You can have, this is the, let's say, these are the packets that you have it from 0 to n. You give a number. Just you give a number. And the point here is you are using a dot hash code. This is a just method. Hashing function will take the object and generate a hash code for you and will, will retain this what? A number from 0 to n. And this number you're going to use it to put this object in which buckets? In which bucket or basket if you want anywhere. In which shelf you want. So, you ask a dot hash code. Give me the hash code for object A. It will retain two. What does that mean? We're going to take two and store it in the bucket two. I will take two and I will store it in two. Because I ask for hash code of A. Now, I have P, object of type P. What is the hash code of P? Give me zero. So, I will take P and put it inside the bucket of zero. So I will take B and put it inside 0. Then I will have C. What is the hash code for C? It's N capital. So I will take C and put it inside N capitals. Now, I will have D. Where is the hash code of D? It's N capital. So I go to N capital and put D. So you have now P0, I mean P at 0, A at 2, and C and D at N capitals. And you have four objects in your array. Now, you try to search inside this hash table. You receive A dot hash code is equal to 2. So you go to A. To if A dot, A dot R equals A, we retain it true. So you can see I didn't compare with P. I didn't compare with C and D. I ask if a dot hash code, what is the a dot hash code, will give me 2. I go just to index 2 and look at the object inside index 2. So how many comparison will I did? Only once. Okay? I will retain it through, so I find my element, I will retain back. Now, let us see another scenario. Here I have z. z dot hash code will retain n. Okay, so which bucket should I go? To the end. How many elements inside n? I have two elements. So I will have to compare them. Z dot equal C, false. Z dot equal D, false. Then I will return to the user, false. I didn't find Z in my hash table. You can see now, I didn't compare with P and A, Y, because they are in different packets. They have different hash code. So only I compare with object with the same hash code. And this is very, very important fact we just highlighted in this slide. So you have three objects. Look at this. C, D, and Z. All of them, they have the same hash code. Are they are equal? No. So do never, never come across a statement saying, if the hash code of the object are equal, then they, I mean the hash code are equal, then the object are equal. Say false. Okay, I will repeat that. If you have two objects 
and this object have the same hash code, then we assume these two objects are equal. Can we say true? No. Okay? This is very important. Many of the students got confused here. We have hash code the same for Z, C, and D, but they are not equal. We have Z and C and D. And this will make it fast for us to do the search and find where is the element. So searching on the tie hash table is normally fast than the linear search and will uh, you see very notice on the speed of the search if you have very large amount of data. So if you have any element on the hash code, maybe you have to compare zero or one for equality and in the worst case, and if you implement the hash code wrongly, all the element will be in one index and that means you have to do the linear search and that's why the hash code implementation is very important if you need to do fast searching and fast comparing for equality. So to do this, we have to do object.hashcode. If you don't override the hash code, you got the implementation from object.hashcode. And what does the object.hashcode do? Object.hashcode use the memory address for the object to compute the hash code. So that's the default implementation for the hash code. We are using the memory address to calculate the hash code. That's why the both objects, they might have the same status, but they are live in the different addresses on the memory, and they have different hash code, and whenever we ask the hash set if the P is there or Q is there, will give me false, because they, even if they are the same status. So that is the case, as you see in this slide, what we said. We have P and Q, they have the same status, one and minus two, but they have live on different address on the memory, so whenever we ask it dot contain Q, we retain false, because the hash code for Q is different from the hash code for P. To handle this, we have to override the hash code. So P dot equal dot Q, they are retained true, but they have now different hash code. Now, the implementation for the hash code is depend on you, whatever you like to implement the hash code. For you have to make sure that if you have two distinct object status, you will have two different object hash code. Okay? For in this, uh, it's very required that this is very important. It's if x equal to y, then x dot hash code equal equal y dot hash code. It's a not. It's a reverse what I said. If the hash code is equal, doesn't mean that objects are equal. But this is a reverse side. If x is equal to y, that means the status of x is equal to the status of y, then the hash code that you should generate is equal. X dot hash code always retain the same value. So one student decide to have this hash code is retain one. Whenever I have an object, x and y, I just retain one regardless of the status. So all the object will have the same hash code, okay? All the object is has the same code, and all the object will be in the same buckets. So you have to do the linear search. You not get benefit of the hash code. Yes, I override the hash code. You told me whenever you decide to override equals, I, I override the hash code. I retain one, okay? I did it, okay? But this is not an efficient implementation. So someone decide, okay, I will do it right this way. I will look at x and I will look at y, I add them together, I will give me a unique point or a unique integers, and I will retain it as a hash code. And you can see the retain type of the hash code is not double or float or boolean. It's a retain type is integer. So we have to retain integer value. And another best implementation is using object.hash. It's relying on object.hash function to generate the hash code for you and you give x and y as a serial input, so it will generate a sequence of input value. Yeah, I think it's, it's okay. It will give the same because it's addition, but this one will not. This one will not, because this is a comma sequence. You got my point? 
you rely here in object dot hash, it will be different in the order. But that's one will add them first, and will send the addition. Three plus uh, five is equal to eight. Will send eight to the user. Five plus three is again eight. Four plus four is eight. So all these points have the same hash code. They will store in the same packets. Okay, but here no, it will be different. Okay, based on the sequence. So likely, and this is very important, and most of the students forget about it, is clips allow you to do this automatically. Once you create your class, you can ask clips generate a hash code and equals from me. Okay, it will generate a hash code for you and if assume this is a class where a student has integer ID and string and we have this constructors okay and get ID and uh, uh, get name and uh, set name and someone decided and this is a clips generation by the way this is the code for a clips generation it will use the prime number and there is a, a, a very important uh, about using the prime number so I will lift this for you to read okay and I will stop uh, at this point and we will discuss next time from comparing for the order.